Open market operations is the primary tool of the Fed. There are two types of open market operations. There's the open market purchase, and then there's the open market sale. Both of these occur in the secondary market. Now, why do I say this? Well, in the primary market, Treasury is auctioning bonds off, selling them, or buying them back when the bonds mature. Now, between those two time periods, uh, the Fed, banks, other central banks, corporations are buying and selling them. And the Fed is one of the, one of the entities that is buying and selling bonds in the secondary market. Now, the Fed conducts an open market purchase, which was kind of discovered at, by accident circa 1920 when the Fed retired a bunch of war bonds. They noticed that the uh, money supply really jumped up. Now, the Fed conducts an open market purchase by buying treasury bonds from banks. Cash flows from the Fed to banks. The quantity of reserves in the federal funds market rises. The federal funds interest rate declines. This is called an expansionary monetary policy. The Fed conducts an open market sale by selling treasury bonds to banks. Now, the Fed has bonds to sell because it purchased them directly from the treasury in the primary market, and this is called monetizing the debt, or it purchased the bonds from banks in the secondary market in a previous open market purchase. Banks give cash, that is reserves, to the Fed in exchange for treasury bonds. The quantity of reserves in the federal funds market declines. The federal funds interest rate increases. This is restrictive monetary policy. In the example below, I'm going to demonstrate how an open market purchase works. Suppose the Fed buys a half a billion dollars worth of bonds from banks. There is no change in the horizontal section of the supply curve. The vertical section increases by 0.5 billion because non borrowed reserves increases by 0.5 billion when the Fed buys bonds from banks in the amount of $0.5 billion. Okay, so the vertical section goes from $28 billion to $28.5 billion. The new equilibrium is found by plugging the $28.5 into quantity demanded for reserves. Hence, the new federal funds rate is $1.5. Okay. Now, again, remember, starting in uh, January of 2003, the Fed began setting the discount rate 100 basis points, or one percentage point, above its federal funds rate target. So the Fed's got to lower the supply curve. It moves it to the right and lowers it. Now, increased non barred reserves means banks have more cash to lend to consumers and businesses. The money supply increases via increased lending, and, as a result, the nominal interest rate declines from I0 to I1. Now, if inflation doesn't change, then the real rate of interest falls by the same amount. Increases in investment, spending, and exports, and lower real rates of interest, increase aggregate demand. Now, the reason why exports go up is because, remember, when real rates of interest are lower, the demand for the dollar falls because foreigners are not converting their currencies into dollars to take advantage of the lower rate of interest in America. So demand for the dollar falls, which makes our goods in other countries cheaper. So that represents a, a boom in exports. Okay, so these three effects shift aggregate demand out to the right until demand crosses aggregate supply at full employment output. This results in higher GDP, lower unemployment, and higher prices. Now it's really important that the Fed try to keep full employment output and real GDP equal, like it is in this case. Now why is that? Well, when real GDP equals full employment, that means unemployment is equal to the natural rate. In other words, unemployment is not too high, unemployment is not too low. 
Now, why is that so important? In my opinion, the primary goal of Fed should be to keep inflation under control. In this diagram, we scatter plotted the change in inflation versus the unemployment rate. After we scatter plot, we can insert a trend line or a regression line. Now, this regression line defines the natural rate of unemployment, which is in this diagram equal to six. Now, what that means is if the Fed can keep unemployment near six, inflation tends not to change. So, if the Fed likes where inflation is, maybe currently it's at two, right around two, then it would like to keep unemployment near six. And as long as it keeps unemployment near six, inflation will remain at two because it won't change. The change in inflation is equal to zero. So this year, if the inflation rate is two, and the unemployment rate, unemployment rate remains at six for the entire year, inflation next year will be two. If unemployment remains at six, and inflation is currently at two, the following year, it'll be at two. So that's why keeping real GDP equal to full employment output is so important. There's no tendency for inflation to increase or decrease because the unemployment rate will equal the natural rate. Open market operations, again, include an open market purchase and an open market sale. Now in this example, we're going to do an open market sale. We're going to demonstrate how an open market sale works. It basically works in the opposite direction of an open market purchase. So we're not going to do any of the diagrams. So all the analysis that we did previously, just kind of do it in backward, do it backwards. Now if the Fed sells $0.5 billion in treasury securities to banks, then $0.5 billion in treasury securities leaves the Fed's vault, while $0.5 billion in cash from member banks enters the, Fed, the Fed's vault. This decreases non bar reserves by $0.5 billion and total reserves 20, from $28 billion to $27.5 billion, decrease in reserve supply. The equilibrium federal funds rate rises while the money supply falls. Nominal interest rates rise, which raises the real rate of interest if inflation does not change. Hence, investment spending and exports decline, decreasing aggregate demand. Lower aggregate demand results in less output and lower prices. In the model below, the federal funds rate is positive. The discount rate is 100 basis points, or one percentage point higher than the federal funds rate. Now, this is the situation before the financial crisis of 2008-2009. In this graphical example, we're going to demonstrate how the new tool works. That new tool is called interest on reserve. Now, during the rescue of the financial system, the Fed bought so many securities, it knew this going in, it was going to buy so many securities that the federal funds rate could actually go negative. To prevent this, in October of 2008, the Fed began paying interest on reserves, which is currently about 0.25%. So, interest on reserves acts as a price floor. The interest rate cannot fall below this level. And it currently is, like I said, at 0.25%. So the discount rate would be at about 1.25% because it's 100 basis points higher than the federal funds rate. Now, this allows the Fed to buy or sell as many securities as it wants without changing the federal funds rate. If the Fed buys securities, notice what happens. The supply of reserves moves to the right. If it sells securities, the supply of reserves moves to the left. In either case, the federal funds rate remains at the level of interest on reserves. So the Fed can buy or sell as many securities as it wants without changing the federal funds rate. Now, the Federal Reserve can also raise and lower the federal funds rate by simply raising the interest on reserves and the discount rate simultaneously. Notice that the quantity of reserves did not change. A major question facing the Fed is how 
is it going to unwind its two to three trillion dollar balance sheet? Now, what it'll probably do is conduct several controlled open market sales while carefully raising interest on reserves. Now, if it does this correctly, and it's never done this before, that has never paid interest on reserves before. So, this is a very tricky business. If it does it correctly, it should be able to return the federal funds market to its pre-crisis state, which means the supply of reserves curve and the demand for reserves intersect on the vertical section of the supply curve. Returning the federal funds market to its previous state allows the Fed to get, conduct monetary policy by doing open market sales and open market purchases, as it did before the crisis.